Are you like the audio is good on your end too? You sound great. Can you still hear me? Yep, yep, yep. Let's go. All right, fantastic. Well, John, thank you so much for joining me today. Welcome to the Texas Titans podcast. Thank you, um, Jason, for the opportunity to hang out with you. Well, man, I appreciate it. And you know what? Nigeria to Texas Titan, brother. You've traveled some ground, my man. So well done, sir. I know. Thank you. It's a long journey for sure. Well, let's just let's just start there with the journey. Where does it begin? How do you find your way to Texas? And then now you're going to have to forgive me on part of this, John, because I, I kind of geek out when it comes, which is kind of weird, but when it comes to health care, innovative health care, all the things that you're doing. When I was in business school, this was kind of what I gravitated toward. So I'm really excited to just to learn about your practice, but also, you know, the whole the whole idea behind Texas Titans is to take guys like you that have executed. You obviously have a, um, you strive for excellence. That's been reflected in your career and the things you're doing. And so we'll talk about kind of those things that made, made you, if you will, how you're built. Okay. Um, but also I want to get into some of the, the healthcare innovations that I know you guys are right in the, uh, the, the vortex of. So, but with that, how does this journey to, uh, to Dallas, Texas, begin. Thank you, Jason. Um, started um, Lagos, Nigeria, born and raised. And um, I came to, to the U.S. to go to college. It was always my dream to go to college. So I, I had an opportunity to come here for college and, um, and ended up attending the University of Texas at Dallas and graduated with an engineering degree. And um, that, that's, that's really the story. And um, you know, a lot of what you've talked about, uh, my journey and um, everything that I've been blessed to accomplish um, could have only happened in America. You know, this is a special place, um, Jason, where someone like me from a different place, distant place can come here, um, get involved, um, work hard, get lots of help. I've gotten a lot of help, a lot of support, and I keep getting a lot of help um to get here and um that's it so that's that's how i got here to go to college were you the first member of your family to attend college no i wasn't um, okay so great question so my parents um both of my parents at best have a sixth grade formal education my okay. dad and mom um, i'm the middle child of five boys um, all five college um, educated, all graduated from college. So I have two older brothers that graduated from college and my two younger brothers as well. For my parents, it was their mission in life to make sure their kids got an education and got a, a good education. So talking about where I started, Jason, um, I'm not self-made. I, I have a great foundation, great parents, very loving, and they believed in the power of an education and they sacrificed everything they had to make sure I had an incredible education, you know, and background and was able to come here and build on that. It was my dream to go to MIT. Um, you may have heard me say this someplace. And um, so I ended up at the University of Texas at Dallas. I'm a very proud alum, so I've got to give UT Dallas a shout out. And it's considered the MIT of the South. So that's as close as I've come. But um, yeah, so my parents valued education and um, supported that. So that's why I'm where I'm at today. You know, it's interesting you say that, John. And so I was a first generation college graduate and, but my parents, the same thing, man, they had so much to do with creating that foundation and the expectation that I would go to school. And I was just doing a research or reading a research paper rather on uh, world-class athletes and why they become world-class athletes. And the one it was five athletes that they profiled, and the one thing that they unanimously said was something you just touched on. With regard to sport, they, all of them were encouraged at an early age by their parents and supported by either their parents or their nearest family members. So 
you know, kudos to your parents for understanding. And like, that's what I've done. You know, you change the trajectory of generations to come whenever you, you have, whenever you do get that education. And that's, you know, I've got two daughters. I've got one at the University of Colorado and one at the University of Alabama. And, you know, it, it literally, it changes the trajectory of a family. So that's, that's fantastic. The only thing is, you know, I might've been a first generation college graduate, but when it came to undergrad, I just had to go to Sul from Sulphur Springs, Texas to Nacogdoches, Texas to SFA. And then eventually to Dallas, I, I, I went to business school at SMU, but uh, man, your journey was a little longer than mine. So, but I, and it's also very cool to hear you talk about just the opportunities that existed, but you had the foresight and the ambition to take advantage of those opportunities. So just take us through kind of at UTD, you had an engineering background. How did that go? And then where does healthcare, where do you start to build your career that would ultimately end up a very successful entrepreneurial career? Great question. You know, Jason, as you were speaking and you were talking about your, your daughters, I couldn't help but think, he doesn't look, young, he doesn't look old enough to have college uh, age kids. So I it's the have, ring light, man. I, it's I, the I ring have light. I comment on that. You're, you look like Thank you're in you. good shape. <laughs> you look like you're in your 30s, even. So, Thanks, uh, man. Like, kudos to you on that. Kudos, I had to just say that. You're welcome on the show anytime, John. I, Thank I love you. it. I'll try to get a pass to come back. Right. So, you know, it's interesting. You, you, you're, you're touching on uh, an interesting, that's an interesting question. So um, when I was at UTD, uh, UT, University of Texas at Dallas, this was in the early 2000s. There was just so much going on in tech. You know, there mm -hmm. was a tech.com um, explosion, the telecom boom. And, you know, mm -hmm. UTD is in Richardson, Texas. Yep. So it's in the telecom corridor. There was Arca Arcatel, Lucent, um, Texas, companies like that. So there was a ton of technology at UTD at the time. And a lot of things were just in flux, a lot of excitement. The internet was new. So I saw some of the most incredible technology in the world while I was at UT Dallas, and I recognized it. So it's, it's one thing to be in a place um, and see it. It's another thing to be there and not even recognize. So I recognized this is a special place. And, um, and I, I, I just have the sense that there's no place in the world like this. I mean, that was a telecom capital of the world. So that's one thing. And then I've always had an interest in business. I've always read business books when I was a kid. I read business biographies. I read business things. I've always been interested in economics. I just read and read and read. I read all the time. Yeah. And, and I had a, sp a special interest in economics, but I, you know, studied engineering, you know, so I always wanted to be able to combine all those practices. So as I, you know, in all my readings, I, I saw that the U.S. economy, 20% um, of it is, 20% of the GDP is healthcare, right? Mm -hmm. That's a massive opportunity. So I understood here is, um, uh, Healthcare is 20% of GDP. I'm doing engineering. So I'd always maybe subconsciously look for opportunities where um, technology and healthcare met each other. Does that make sense to you? So Absolutely. It was, it was there, I think. Yeah. So, so let me tell you a story about how I got into the business, if you don't mind. Sure, yes. So, so while I was at UTD, so I was, I was already thinking healthcare and technology, healthcare for all the opportunities and technology because there's just so much. So I had a, one afternoon, I was a typical broke college student, Jason, maybe a lot broker than norm, um, most people. So I went to go visit my aunt, that ran a, she was a director of nursing for a home health organization. So I went to go visit and um, she was going to give me $100 or $200, something like that. But I showed up anyway and um, she was in her office and there were lots of different workstations, folks at their workstations. And, and I just started asking questions. I said, you're here. Um, all those folks are walking around, working around you, or you all, or you guys connected on a computer network. And she said, no, what is that? We take that for granted now, but it was 2001, that was a big deal. Absolutely. So I explained the computer network, the benefits to her. And um, she said, oh, that's a great idea. She took me to her boss. I explained, and they said, go build that for us. So I quickly became the um, computer guy for that business and computer guy for lots of similar businesses, um, home health organizations. So I saw here's a, a business that's underserved from a technology perspective, but just more importantly, I saw here's an entire industry that's underserved from a technology perspective, and I saw so much promise. I recognized early on that healthcare was gonna go home. The future of healthcare was in, was in the home because I thought it was more cost effective. Mm -hmm. um, it's what people want. It's, um, and I understood how technology has been driving the evolution of healthcare in, in a lot of ways that people were not thinking about that at the time. 
you know, so those are thoughts were in my mind. So I became the IT guy for that business and lots of similar businesses and the word got around and um, did that. And at some point I told my aunt, you know, why don't you set up your own home health organization? And she said, oh, I wouldn't even know where to start. I said, oh, I can do that for you. Rather naively, um, looking back now, I did that. And so I researched the licensing and regulatory standards for you know, care at home organizations in Texas. I already knew the technology parts of the business and all the opportunities there. I knew that. Right. I knew the operational pieces from all the work that I had done with lots of different um, organizations in, in Dallas and increasingly statewide. So now I was exposed to all the regulatory aspects of the business. So I, so I, I was a consultant for young 20 year old kid, 21 year old kid, the consultant for them. So I got her business off the ground. She did that successfully. And she started telling other people, if you need help doing this, go talk to this guy. So now I knew the operational aspects, licensing and regulatory aspects, understood the technology aspects. And I saw here as a, there's a huge need here. So eventually I created a cloud-based technology platform to service the industry and the rest is history. Wow. Wow. And you were, I mean, that is early for stuff that is just now really coming to fruition with some really exciting, you know, technologies and that sort of thing. So now how long was it from the time that your aunt kind of introduced you to the home healthcare space? And then you started pairing the IT uh, uh, acumen that you had with the healthcare space that you, that, that access comes along. And, and by the way, I'm going to have to ask you about this because I'm the same way uh, when it comes to books. I mean, you see behind me, that's, that's my trophy collection behind us right there, you know, and I just, um, I have this deal called the Vitruvian letter, which I hope you'll subscribe to. It's my, my personal newsletter. And I just had my first Vitruvian challenge where I uh, wanted to be able to read one book per week. That's my, that's my mission. So I just launched the first one. And so tell me some of the, uh, the, the, your favorite reads that kind of gave you at least a little bit of an idea of forming your blueprint to start to create your first business plan. And then, and then how, how long was it before access comes into play? Great question. Jason, you're, you're asking some really, really insightful questions. Awesome. You know, I, um, I read a book many years ago when I was a kid that I really, that really influenced my life. I believe um, it's called um, Ken and Abel by Jeffrey Archer. If yes. You know, if you've heard about the book. I have heard it. I have not read it, but now I will. Yeah. You know, it talked about a, a Polish immigrant and how he came mm -hmm. to the um, um, U.S. Um, and went on to great success. You know, so even from an early age, that book told me, you know, so stories are important. What you read matters. So I formed in, you know, just everything I was exposed to, I understood, hey, here's a, a lot of opportunity, you know, so, and I wanted to go to college here to get a world class education. But that book, that story, that his story in that book resonated with me. That, they, that anything is possible, you know. Um, but I like to read a lot. But now I, I like to read business biographies. Mm -hmm. and I like to read biographies on very successful people. I'm a history buff. I like to read a lot of historical things. And um, I'm particularly a student of American presidential history. It's an area of interest of mine. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, I had always wondered why I was so interested in that. And I was having a conversation with a friend last week or the week before, and maybe it finally came together for me, why I'm so interested in American presidential history. Uh -huh. And as we were talking, I, I realized, you know, the, the, the United States is the leader in the world. And maybe subconsciously, I, I'm thinking the American president represents the pinnacle of leadership. Um, mm -hmm globally. So it was something I've been interested in and just democracy and all that. So I like to read up about American, American history from the founding fathers all through. And if you look, there are lots of presidential biographies here. Of I have a lot more. I read everything on American presidential history. So, and, and then it's just leadership. I read anything about leadership. I want to be a better leader. I want right. to learn from other leaders. So so those are some thoughts, Jason. Okay, so whenever I say the word leader, who comes to mind to you and why? Oh, that's a that's a tough one. Just it's not just one person. Yeah, I, they're just leaders in different um, in lots of different ways. You know, right, right. Um, for business, I I admire Warren Buffett as a business leader, yep. as a successful business leader. Um, mm -hmm. um, there are lots of leaders. I think Abraham Lincoln was a great leader. I think FDR mm -hmm. was a great leader. I right. think um, 
Um, yeah, so it's, it's just all kinds of leadership. It's lots of different people. I think Gandhi was a great leader. I think Mandela was a great leader. So, yeah. and they're all different people, you know, but um, one thing that I think about, because I talk about leadership a lot and people ask me what I think a leader is, and these are things that I ponder on a lot and try to really um, condense my thoughts and synthesize my thoughts and make them easier for folks to understand. And one that I really, that resonates with me lately is the idea that a leader is someone that um, accepts responsibility for a desired outcome. You know, right. this right. is where we want to go. And I own that and I'll do whatever I need to do to help us get there. That's what's resonated with me now. Well, and one of the things too, that I know about you, and it's, it, it does not surprise me that you mentioned U S presidents and Gandhi and Mandela. And just from what I know about you, and I want to talk about this a, a little bit is, from what I know, you have a servant leadership's a servant leader's heart, and that's something that really resonates with me. You know, it's it's something that as a leader, as an entrepreneur, as a business executive, that it's not just about the the profit motive. You know, you got to make money to stay in business. It's important, but it's also creating a culture. It's creating a, a purpose for employees to to draw drive towards. And I know that's something that's been important to you. So as you have built access. What are some of the ways that you have been able to implement that servant leadership and create a culture where, you know, today's younger employee in particular is much more interested from what I've seen in most studies that are coming out. The millennials are much more interested in working for a purpose rather than just how big their bank account gets. You know, they're not, they're not out, you know, shooting for the new nine 11. They're, you know, they, they want to have a reason to go to work and feel like that the leader of that organization shares that, that mission. So as the leader of your organization, what are some ways that you have executed on that philosophy? Okay. Love that question again. Um, First and foremost, um, Jason, I believe that a leader's single most important um, um, responsibility is to create a safe space for in, in a business for all their people to bring their best selves to work. Yeah. That's the single most important thing. Um, you want to create a place where everyone can come and be themselves and be a part of something meaningful and contribute themselves and contribute to whatever you're trying to build. Right. in a safe manner. Very important. Very important. Um, um, I also believe, as you touched on, that business is a force for good, mm -hmm. that beyond making money, beyond making profits, businesses have a responsibility to make their communities better. I believe that. And, and I'm glad that, you know, last year, the Business Roundtable put out a statement in, in August saying, you know, business should do more than just make money. Let's make the community whole and do everything for all stakeholders. Right. And businesses, there's just so much resources and so much that business brings to the table beyond just making money. And, and it, an easy example that I give is, do you really want businesses to come to a community, make as much uh, money as they want to make and leave that community devastated? Is that what we want businesses to do? Right. So business should lend their resources, their expertise, their talents of their people to give back to the community and make the community a better place, make it a stronger place. So before I continue on that, I want to go back to the culture comment that you made earlier. And, and even in building access, I wanted to build something that would, that would last a long time, something that was really special. I wanted to build something that I'll be proud to work at, that I'll be proud to be a part of. Mm -hmm. So it was important that we got the culture right. And I just wanted to be a, build a company that I would like to go work at and others will enjoy a place where everyone can bring their whole selves to work. So the culture was important. Mm -hmm. So we have a, a document that we call the access way. You may have seen it. It's a one page document that outlines who we are, our commitment to our people, to our clients, to our partners, to the community and just all stakeholders, very important. And at Access, our culture is the Holy Grail. That's what we believe. You know, Jason, it may surprise you to know that it took us three years to come up with that one page document. Yeah. Three years. So yeah. what we did at the time was I told our people that, hey, you know, it's culture is important. We want to build the Access way. And I just don't want it to be my words. So let's think about this together. Let's put on paper the type of organization we're trying to build, right? So we had 
we our people we call them accessions. So we had them share their thoughts. They added all types of different things to it, and we thought about that over a three-year process. So what's what's really meaningful for us? What do we want to be a thousand years from now? What type of organization do we want to be? A, a thousand when we're long gone, how do we want our people to conduct themselves? How should they treat people and all that? Right. So we over a three-year period we worked on it together, and we came up with that one-page document. Very important. And it's not just words on paper. You know, anyone can get a beautiful set of words on paper. We have to make sure that's that ideal that we aspire um, to live up to. So I'll tell you one quick story, and I'll and I'll shut up. You know, uh, many years ago, I I was at our old offices. I was in my office, and um, we had uh, uh, we we had it where we didn't want people eating at their desk. If you wanted to eat, go eat in the break room and all that. So I had this very important call I had in, that I needed to take. I hadn't had lunch, so I had to eat and take that call. So I grabbed the plate, was at my desk, was taking that call, and then I put the phone down and continued my having lunch. And one of our folks came into my office and said, John, but you shouldn't be doing that. It's not the access way. Jason, before they were done saying that, I picked up that plate and ran straight to the break room and that was the last time that ever happened. So the wow. idea is you have a culture, but you have to make sure you're all held accountable. People know it's real. It's not just words on paper. The culture has to be palpable where people can feel it. They know it's real. And in, in our interactions with our people, with our clients, with our community, with our partners, everyone, we want, them to make, we want to make sure that we're demonstrating the access way in every interaction. And then when you, when you tie that to the idea of business being a force for good, that's just who we are. I love that. I love that. And one of the things that you mentioned there, you know, Jack Welch was really big on creating a culture of candor. And, you know, with General Electric, you still got to think that, well, no matter how hard you try as the leader, there's still people that are going to hold back because, you know, I always tell folks that if there's one thing that I could say that I gained from business school, it was this. Not only did I learn to ask better questions, I learned to be free of fear to ask questions. And a lot of times, you know, the, the, it, we believe that coming and being who we are and being able to say, I don't understand what you're talking about. Please explain that further. That's a sign of weakness, a sign of, or a sign of a lack of intelligence. But what I learned in business school, which man, I, I'll tell you, when I got there, I just assumed everyone was a lot smarter than me, a lot more accomplished than me. And when some of the smartest people in my cohorts started asking these, these questions. I thought, Oh, okay. It is okay to ask questions. And so I love the fact that you started with the, with the idea that people can come and be open to share and exchange ideas because that is so critical. And a lot of organizations, I think that, um, you know, it's getting better, but for so long, you know, there was this idea that, well, if I ask the question, then, I'm, I'm going to be perceived as not engaged or stupid or whatever. So, so kudos to you for, for pushing that forward. And then the whole idea of, of doing good. And what are the things, what are the things that access is, is doing to execute in, in the footprint that you serve there in the Metroplex to, to create, to become a part of the social fabric of Dallas and to do good and to be not only seen as a world-class company, you know, innovative and in the space of the technology and healthcare, but also just a great um, neighbor and corporate citizen. What are some things that you guys have implemented? You know, that's a, I, I love that question. And I like your comments about, you know, just a, a learner's mindset. That's what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. A mindset to everything that you're doing. And, um, you know, um, JC, there's still so much that you and I don't know. So yeah. that, there's just so much to learn. And, you know, at Access, we say, may the best idea win. And, um, you know, it doesn't matter where that idea comes from, you know. So I, I, I see it the same way you, you see it. You know, just make sure folks can make all the best ideas and make things work. So I'm sure you know that, you know, again, it starts, it starts at the top leadership. And, and as far as being useful to the community, it's about service. So I, I serve as um, the chair, um, Marino, the chairperson of the Dallas Regional Chamber this year. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, the, the Dallas Regional Chamber is a very important um, um, or, um, organization in our community. And the focus is to make sure our Dallas um, community, Dallas region, is the best place to live, 
um, work and do business for all people. And, um, and I'm standing on the shoulders of giants, people that have invested so much to make our community better. So in my role um, as chairperson of the DRC, it's making sure we can uh, keep doing all we can to make our community better. So this year, we've been confronted with lots of challenges, as you're aware. COVID is one good example. And then we'll talk about all the issues around all the unrest in our community overall. So for COVID, when it happened, you know, um, I've said this publicly that, you know, I've heard the word unprecedented so many times. And it's still not cliche. It's really real. Yeah. This is unprecedented, unprecedented on a global scale. So in the early days, everyone was terrified. What do we do? Well, you know, I believe that business is a force for good. And I believe business had an important role to play in helping get our community through that. So what I wanted to do was make sure we align and galvanize our entire community in partnership with our other community organizations, um, political leaders, just leaders in the community and say, what can we do to save as many lives as possible, protect the livelihoods of people, keep our community safe, fight for our future, and we keep doing that. Okay, how can we do all that work and do that together? So I'm glad our entire business community has been aligned. We created a fund for small businesses. I believe small business is the backbone of any of, of, of business or of our community. So that, um, that local pizzeria that's been there for 40 years or that dry cleaner that you've been going to, what can we do to help them make sure they're facing challenges that's no fault of theirs? So what can we do? to help them get through a difficult time. So we have loans for those types of businesses. We created a fund to give them loans to get them through this crisis. It's called the um, Dallas Revive Fund. We're doing that. And then a lot of them are having to pay for PPE. They didn't budget for that. They don't have the resources for that. So as big businesses, let's come together. Let's all get together and give our small businesses PPE and help them um, through this crisis. And then as they're going through that, let's find them mentors that can help them deal with challenges and the crisis management and all that. And we're doing that. In fact, earlier today, um, I sent another note to our board um, to get, we need more mentors because our businesses were helping them, but we need more mentors that can help them get through this crisis. So we're doing that for our entire um, community. And then when the Judge Floyd situation happened, you know, and there was an awakening in the nation around um, all the um, disparities and, inequities that exist in our community, again, business is a force for good. We cannot sit on the sidelines. How can we help? What role do we have to play to make this happen? So at the, at the Dallas Regional Chamber, what we did is we've created the first ever board level council focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion, mm -hmm. where only board members, these are leaders of the biggest businesses in our community, to come together and say, what can we do to do the right thing for our community now? That was part of my plan for the year anyway, because I had four priorities as coming in as chairperson. It was business as a force for good, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, education, and helping small businesses. So those are four important items, and they couldn't have been more relevant in a year like this, where there's so much turmoil in the world, Jason. So, so, so we came together, created this new council on diversity, equity, and inclusion, focused on four areas, diversity and leadership. How can we make sure that we can help all the people, all the talent in our region grow and have them grow into leadership positions in the C-suite and organizations, you know, and that's diversity and leadership. And then um, education and workforce. How do we keep making sure we bring our entire um, community along? Uh, we have changing demographics into the future, but how can we make sure to build on all the success? How can we keep investing in our community to put us in a position to build all the success and carry everyone along? along? And then in parts of our community that have been underinvested in historically, what are the things that we need to do? If it's housing, if it's nutrition, food deserts, all these issues, let's weigh in and do something about that. And then the last bucket on this diversity, equity, and inclusion work is um, this criminal justice policies. Mm -hmm. Where are areas that we can work together and, and have business lean in to make a difference? And we're doing all that. And then, and then we took two important steps. One was also we hired a a new senior vice president for diversity, equity, and inclusion to make sure that we're thinking about this every single day. How can we make our community more equitable, more just for all people? And then we also um, brought on a, a senior vice president for community engagement. 
you know, somewhat, and, and the way I describe this is how do we take business into the communities that are underserved and how do we bring those communities closer to business so we know their needs and we can leverage the collective resources of our business community to, to move things along for them. So I'm doing that. All our people at Access are involved in all that work. To go back to your question about how is Access doing all that, but we're doing that in um, partnership with lots of other stakeholders in our community. And I've been bragging that just given how the Dallas business community, um, Jason, has come together to respond um, to just all the challenges th this year, I, I know I talk to friends all over the country, what we're doing is a model for the rest of the country on how a business community can partner with all the relevant stakeholders to move their community forward at a very difficult time. So I am very proud of the business leaders in Dallas. They are world class. Well, and I, I could not agree more. And one of the things that, uh, you know, so Houston being the the most diverse city in the country gets a lot of attention, as, especially as it relates to the state of Texas. But what a lot of people outside the Metroplex don't really realize is that Dallas is a global city. In fact, and, and, it's, and it's exciting to be a part of that, that ecosystem at a time such as this, because one of the things, uh, a dear friend of mine that's in private equity, he said, you know, and of course, this was a number of years ago, not certainly not now uh just because of the, the the like you said the unprecedented events that we're we're facing but he said outside of manhattan the most optimistic place to do business for investment for innovation you name it is dallas you know it's just no doubt no doubt jason you know and i tell people the american dream is uh is live and well i am a testament to that it's obvious absolutely i, I agree with you totally well, and then, and also, you know, one of the things that we're seeing, I, something, you know, some studies show between 1,000 and 1,500 people a day coming to the state of Texas, many of which are finding their way to North Texas. And yep. so the fact that, you know, you're leading an effort to be prepared for that inward migration, it is just absolutely uh, imperative. So I love to hear that. And then also, that is no small task to chair an organization like the Dallas Regional Chamber. I mean, because it is a world-class organization. The legacy of da Dallas business leaders is remarkable. And so to be in that group, and again, it goes back to you leading by example at Access, your employees, knowing that their boss, their leader is shaping the, uh, the business community. That's a that's a remarkable thing. So, uh, so that's got to be exciting. Now, let's talk about healthcare. I want to geek out a little bit because I, I, I think that uh, you know, and our our mutual friend Chris Crow and I talked about this. That there are so many ways we can get people away from the mothership that is the big hospital, the most inefficient, costly beast that we have in the healthcare system, and and it's in the home. Talk to the listeners about some of the innovations that you see, both from like, like I haven't, I used to be a watch guy. Now it's all about utility value for me. I wear an Apple watch because I want to know my heart rate. I want to know my beats per minute. I want to know my calorie burn. Uh, and I think that the, that some of the, the innovations that are coming about with monitoring, I've got a daughter that has type one diabetes. So watching the innovations in that, to watch her be able to monitor her blood, her, her blood sugar better. What are some cool things that you're seeing that we can move people toward the home with, and, and, and marry technology with their health care that will, you know, we're talking about flattening the curves a lot with regard to COVID, but how we flatten the curve of this, this unbelievably expensive behemoth that is known as the American health care. How, how can we do that? Great question. Well, you're, you already talked about a lot of the um, gadgets. So mm -hmm. but what I want to do, just I want to step back. And I think mindset matters, philosophy matters. Okay. So let, let's talk about history a little bit. You know, you know, you know, I believe the future of healthcare is in the home. Totally. That's why I get up every day. That's what I solve for um, every day. And it's easier to make that case now in a COVID situation, but we've been saying this for a long time, but I'm glad folks are understanding that um, more and more when you know technology has driven the evolution of healthcare more than people realize so you've touched on it now but again i want to take people back and really explain it so um in the early days of 
the healthcare delivery system as we all understand it, you'll have doctors or caregivers, nurses, go to a patient's home and have a bag with them and go see a patient. And all the technology that existed at the time was in that bag. Mm-hmm. And they took it with, it was technology. Yeah. And as technology got into healthcare, there was a need to have patients close to all the technology in healthcare, the diagnostic equipment and all that, hence hospital beds and all that being placed to the technology for care. So the hospital that, as we know it today, is a more recent phenomenon, Jason. This is, this, this is a recent thing. So if you have the ability to really, re, to really reflect on history, you realize this is a more recent phenomenon. Well, healthcare is driving the evolution again. So you talked about your watch, your phone, and all that. And I tell people, your, your, your phone is a more powerful healthcare device than all the huge diagnostic things that, that have been in hospitals for such a long time. So healthcare is personal. So it's where you are. So I describe a, a, a concept of healthcare on demand. It doesn't matter where you are. Technology should get the healthcare that you need to where you are. Mm-hmm. So, and the good news about this is it's more cost effective. It's more convenient. It's what you and I want. We've seen several studies where people will say they would rather get healthcare at home than go anywhere else. And I joke with some of my friends that, you know, just about everywhere, there was a, maybe a, a corner store in a gas station in the past. Now you're in an urgent care center. Getting, right, right. It's about getting closer and closer to people. So you talked about the device and all that. So beyond just personal devices, it's just the, the concept. So imagine if I needed to, I'll tell you a story about how I think about this. Imagine if there's something wrong, I'm not feeling well, and I'm sitting in front of my TV watching Netflix. And then I think, oh, what's going on? And then I can just hit a button and talk to my doctor and say, hey, Dr. Smith, I'm not feeling well. You know, and he says, well, but because he has access to everything that's going on with me in real time, as you described, your phone mm-hmm. and all that, he can say, mm-hmm. well, John, you need to get some rest and, um, you know, drink some water, go to bed early, I'll check on you tomorrow, okay? So the next day, I'm not getting any better. I hit that button and I say, hey, doc, I'm not feeling well, what's going on? So he checks, you know, because he has access to that in real time, right? He says, John, you know, um, uh, I see this is elevated. I said, that's elevated. Okay, I'll call in a prescription for you, okay? Calls in the prescription. I don't have to get up. Someone shows up at my door in five minutes for the right prescription for me, right? Right. So I take my medicines, you know, a day or so later, it's, I'm still not feeling much better. I hit that button again. I say, hey, doc, what's going on? And he says, oh, I think there's something wrong. I need to get you checked into a hospital. Um, but he doesn't need to, so, but he's got access to all that in real time. And then a vehicle shows up and transported to the hospital. They don't have to, I don't have to sit in that reception area, 45 minutes filling out any form. They know who I am from when I walk in with facial recognition, they know who I am. This is important because it's more cost effective. We have a healthcare costs are massive in this country because a lot of folks are engaging the healthcare system at the most expensive point Exactly. in healthcare. And in Texas, we have um, health insurance challenges, health, a lot of those challenges that you're familiar with. So we all can benefit from a, a technology-driven um, healthcare system that's more personal, just more cost-effective. So they just, it's just the, the possibilities are endless, Jason. And I'll stop there. Well, I, I love to hear that because I, I, I agree with you. We, and, and also the, the whole business model of the hospital, that you, and you talked about it earlier, healthcare outcomes. There is, now, now, now granted, this is not to say that there's any hospital deliberately doing that. So listener, please understand what I'm saying. I'm just saying their cost model is such that they need you to be sick to pay their bills. That's, and that's a bad, that's a bad business model, but that's just the way it is at this point, because exactly what you just said, that's why it is so expensive to run there because it costs so much. I do think that, and it's cool that the urgent cares, which can basically what is like, you can get 70% of the care that you can get in urgent care, or you can get 70% of the care that you can get in an emergency room in an urgent care scenario. And to the listener, look at the back of your insurance card, and you will notice that your copay is lower on urgent care than it is for an emergency room. That's for a reason. Urgent cares are more efficient. So it's almost like they've, there's this migration happening from the mothership to the emergency room to urgent care, and then thanks to companies like Access, it's finally getting into the home where the patient is more comfortable, they're more monitored, and it's, it's got to be a little bit more precise as well. So that's, that's, that's good. But just so the good news is even 
folks that have been in the, you know, the traditional health delivery systems often, mm -hmm. they understand this because I have right. a lot of friends that are leaders in health systems and they get it. They're also looking for ways to get healthcare closer and closer to the patient. So they're part of the solution and we're working with them to make things happen. So they also recognize they want to deliver the type of healthcare that they want. And, and I'm, I am hopeful. I'm an optimist and, and I, was, I am also aware of work that we're doing with them to drive it but I think everyone understands there's a better way to do this and we all need to work together to make it happen. All right. So John, I want you to put your philosophical hat on for a minute because the, the audience as best as I can tell, uh, my audience is probably from 25 to 60 years old, mostly entrepreneurs or entrepreneur wannabes and that sort of thing. Mm. And to, I always like to try to, with uh, accomplished leaders like you, to pull some wisdom out for that younger listener, to give them some guidance on how do they know which path to take. You and I, I think we could both agree, if you're chasing money, you might as well be like Don Quixote slaying windmills. It just that's not a reason to to pursue any endeavor. It, you match up what you love and your talents and you'll be much more successful regardless of the money involved. But what would you tell that young would be entrepreneur? And, the, and, and here's where I would like you to go with that. There's a big difference between someone who is cut out to be an entrepreneur and someone who just likes the idea of being an entrepreneur. And I think a lot of people find out the hard way once they're having to worry about the light bill, the employees, the good, the bad, they realize man, it was kind of nice just working for the other guy where I showed up, I did my job and I went home and, and I watched Netflix, you know? Mm -hmm. So to that, uh, that individual, and it might be even a mid career person that thinks they want to cash out and go start, you know, hang out their own shingle gives just some words of wisdom that you picked up, you know, through failures. Like, let's just start there. I've said a lot, I've rambled in that question, but here's, here's where I want to start with that. Tell me the biggest failure you've learned the most from. Let's just start there. Oh, God. Whew. You know, I'll answer that question as I think through it, if you don't mind. Go but for it, man. You said a lot there. And, you know, um, I'll say this, uh, Jason. The single most difficult thing I've ever done in my life has been an entrepreneur. It's the hardest thing by far, yeah. by far. And, you know, and, and I've said this before that, you know, just jokingly that, you know, that I describe entrepreneurs as, as people that are, are such a glutton for punishment that, and they don't know when to stop. Can know? I give you my favorite quote that I have learned on this podcast from one of my, one of my favorite guests? He said, entrepreneurs are the only people who will work 90 days a week to avoid a 40, or excuse me, will work 90 hours a week to avoid a 40 hour a week job. Yep, that's what yep, an entrepreneur is. Yeah, yep, it's so it's hard, yeah. you know. And and I've told a lot of people sometimes don't do it. It'll be the single most difficult thing you've ever done in your life, you know. So I guess in a lot of ways, some people are wired to do it. Some yep. are wired a certain way. I, I think I'm one of those people. I would, um, and when I when I see something that I am passionate about and I can wrap my mind uh, around just for a purpose, you know, I can stick with that. It's hard. It's hard. And I tell a lot of people sometimes, don't do it. And I know that's not what you want to hear yet on, on, a, on a call like this. Well, I tell them, don't do it. Yeah. But if you absolutely have to do it, there are ways to do it. Does yeah. that make sense to you? Absolutely. It's hard. Do yeah. not do it. But if you have to do it and you, you care about it and there's a solution that you want to bring out to the world, um, you know, get as much help as possible. No matter how brilliant you are, what you know is only just a small piece of what you need to be a successful entrepreneur. You yep. need a ton of more skills that you do not have. Right. right. What you, I mean, for instance, you, you grow a business, you've got a great idea to solve a problem. You're solving it. We have to sell it. You have to market it. You have to support it. You have to sustain it. You have to deal with the banks. You have to deal with lawyers. You have to deal with taxes. There's so much to it. And you have to have the ability to build relationships and connect with people um, and, uh, and just carry them along. Now, going back to your question about a big mistake I've made, you know, I think I've always understood some of those things, Jason. So what I try to do is 
not make as many mistakes by surrounding myself with a lot of counsel, with a lot of wisdom. And the measure it tends, you know, people think entrepreneurs just jump in um, and are impulsive. That's not true. In my case, I measure 10 times if I right. cut because I know what the risk, I know the risks involved. And I know if you go in and you get it wrong and you have very limited resources, it can be um, very difficult. But one example of something that's not quite as, uh, maybe it wasn't quite as um, um, uh, fatal in my case was, I remember many, many years ago, um, uh, we had a we had a good month. What I considered a good month relative to where we are today, it's small potatoes compared to where right. we are now. But I thought we had a good month. We've been marketing. I said, oh, you know, we we shouldn't market anymore. We've got the ship sailing. You know, everything should work. Just in about a, a month or so later, the sales numbers just went down because it was still early on. We didn't have quite an established uh, brand reputation and all that, and we we needed to just keep investing and doing all that work that needed to be done. And um, in, it was a February. I'll never forget that. That lesson stuck with me. And, and the idea now is just never stop doing whatever you're doing. As an entrepreneur, you know, and, and I explained it to my people that, you know, I see it as in, in business and entrepreneurship, it's binary. You're either growing or you're dying. There's nothing in between mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, you're either driving that growth and success of the business or you're dying off. So I remember that lesson. So you may call it a mistake. It's a lesson. I may share some with, more with you as we keep talking. But now I tell our people, you've got to show up every day and keep doing whatever we're doing every day. And we're going to do this forever. We will never stop doing it. Well, okay. So see, that's, that's, that's the, th those are the things, the moments that I love the most. And there's something that you, that has been a theme throughout this conversation that, Man, you were way ahead of the game, then uh, way beyond where I was whenever I bought my first business. I was 28 years old, and I was probably too naive, too stupid, and then you sprinkle in some arrogance with that. It's a bad recipe, and I almost refused to ask for help. You know, I had family members in the same business that could have helped me. My, my mom, you know, my first business that I purchased was a real estate brokerage at mm. my mom's recommendation, and... I never asked her for help because I thought that'd be a sign of weakness. You know, that was one of the biggest mistakes. And so to the listener out there, especially the young listeners, you know, I always preach, find mentors, find people, surround yourself. And the, the cool thing is, man, at the age that we are now, and I, I mean, I think I could definitely say this about you, just given your track record. If you come to me and you ask for a favor, it's that old deal. Don't come and ask me for a favor. But if you ask me for my advice, I will share willingly because I want, to try to help people avoid some of the mistakes yep. that I've made. So the fact that, uh, that you have done that so well, I think speaks volumes of, of what you've done. And then also talking about keep going and growing, you know, that's basically just another uh, summation of what Peter Drucker said. The only thing a business can do is grow and innovate, grow and innovate. That's it. That's, the, that's, that's a company that you, you can't, it's not, it can't become a static operation that you got to grow and you got to innovate. And so and that's, that to me is exactly what you said. And so, uh, and Hey man, no, it doesn't bother me at all. I, I've told several people, no, don't do it. And you can find that out by the questions they're asking, because again, I, I love using this example. I used to think it would be a really good idea for me to own a Harley Davidson motorcycle until I went to my church parking lot and tried to ride one and realized it was just that it was an idea, but the reality of it was a terrible notion. <laughs> you know, yes. And I want to say something real quickly about mentorship and how critical that is. You know, we talk about what I'm doing now as mm -hmm. chairman of the Dallas regional chamber, as a chair of the Dallas regional chamber. When I joined, I was barely 30 but I wanted to learn from others. So by joining the Dallas Regional Chamber, I was surrounded by the best and the brightest minds in business right. in our community, incredible people. And I was there to just learn from them, you know? And, you know, I, I believe, you know, and this is, you know, for entrepreneurs, they say by beholding, you become, mm -hmm. surround yourself with what you want to be like. And, you know, part of it is osmosis. It happens. You become like that, you know? Yep. So I'll be in the room. And I'll be taking furious notes because these are the titans of our business community. Yep. All I wanted to do was learn and serve. If they needed help and it was something I could help with, I raised my hand. And I never had any thinking at all 
ever um, to oh, be the chair of the Dallas Regional Chamber. I just wanted to learn and grow and serve. And I kept doing that and building relationships. And I've learned so much from my friends and colleagues there. And they've supported so much and continue to support. And access wouldn't be what it is without um, their help. And even in my role as chairperson today, I was able to recon reconcile myself with the position when I saw it as another opportunity to learn and grow. So, so to your comments earlier about being, bringing a servant's um, heart to whatever I do, I am here to serve our business community. I'm here to serve our community and do all I can, building on what others that came before me have done to keep making sure that our community is the best place in this country, best place in the world to live, work, do business for all people. And I wouldn't be here just without the support and mentoring and friendship of incredible business leaders um, in our community. And I keep get, I'm still getting all that help and support now. I'm still learning so much from them. So, so to you, to your listeners, I couldn't, um, I cannot over, overemphasize just how important that mentor, mentorship and building all the right relationships, how important that is. Well, and Kat, that, um, that leads us to something you said earlier, you want to build access so that it, a thousand years from now, what kind of company did you want to build? So one of my, now I got to, I got to make confession here. And the, this audience has heard me say this before in the seven habits of highly effective people, you know, Stephen Covey, there's this one scene where you walk by a church, you hear music, you follow the music in and you realize you're at a funeral. And as you get closer to the front, you realize you're at your own funeral. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those parts in the book where he says, now close your book and think really hard about what you want said about you. Well, I usually skim past those because I'm, if I'm reading a book, I want to keep reading and I don't do the close the book exercises, but I was reading another book, Visioneering by Andy Stanley. And he said, and he brought that up. And so I finally closed the book and thought about what I wanted said about me whenever my journey's done. So when it's over for John Olajide and your, your journey has ended. What do you want to be said as a leader, as a friend, just kind of what is that legacy that you hope to leave behind? Whew. Wow. I didn't know I was going to get really, really, really hard questions. Today. Going deep, baby. <laughs> uh, that's, that's a, uh, Ooh, you know, um, I think I'll keep it simple, you know, and it, it's really, I want it to be said that he left everything better mm. than, he, than when he touched it, than he met it. And, you know, everything that I do, I bring all of, I try to bring my whole self to it. Um, and in my role as um, chairperson for, for the Dallas Regional Chamber this year, for instance, I spent all of last year working on getting ready for that role talking to all the different leaders and asking questions about what do you think is needed? I talk to political leaders, business leaders, community leaders, just the elders in our community and say, what do you believe we need at this time to make our community better? And so I didn't have to be a genius about it. They just told me what it was. Mm. And that's how I was able to come up with the four ideas that I thought were really important for our community now. And now with COVID, that's proven pressure in a way, you know, yeah. well, it's the right thing. It, with a global pandemic, we haven't had to change anything. Just stay the course. And I, um, I, I want it to be said when I'm done now and anything else that I get involved in in life that I left it better than I met it. Mm. Well, John, I can tell you this, my man, you've left this show better than it was before you came on. And I mean that, I mean that look, this project, the Texas Titans podcast was a selfish endeavor on my part to go out and meet talented, uh, accomplished people and continue my own self-education. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, my brother, I am, uh, I am better having had this conversation. I think this audience is, uh, is going to would agree with me that they're better having heard from you. And so I know you are a terribly busy man, and uh, I am so grateful for not only you taking this time, but I hope that this uh, is the spring for, springboard like this show has been to many folks uh, of a friendship 
if I can ever return this favor of you taking this time, man, I'm a phone call away. And uh, next time I'm, I'm in Dallas, I would love to come shake your hand and say, or, or at least give you the give you the bat wing bump, you know, to be be COVID appropriate and say let's, thank let's, you. Let's hang out and looking forward to it. Thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts. You know, this is a, a distinguished audience, and I hope I've been able to add a few nuggets here and there to make all of us better. So thank you for the opportunity. I'm grateful, very grateful. And one more, you just reminded me of something before we go. You have a new program coming out that I saw on LinkedIn. Tell the audience about it. I think if they're listening to this, I know they would listen, want to listen to. Yeah, please, please talk about it. It's called Conversations for Good. And yes. what, I, what I'll be doing is talking to business leaders, community leaders, just leaders everywhere about what they're doing to make for good to make our community better, our world better. You know, I've talked about business being a force for good. So I want business leaders come talk about what they're doing personally, what their organizations are doing for good to make our world a better place. I love that. And when does the show premiere? And is it going to be a podcast, I assume? It is. I think the first one was um, um, launched today, actually. So you can go check it out awesome. on LinkedIn now. Follow me on LinkedIn. Take a look at that. It'll be amazing. You know, I prefer to listen than speak. So just this is hard for me to just talk, talk, talk. I'd much rather be asking the question. I'd yeah. much rather be in your position. So I am looking forward to talking to incredible leaders from all over the world and having them share, share just wisdom with us and thoughts on how they're making the world a better place. So I want to be asking a lot of questions. So I look forward to that. So And have everyone join us whenever they can. Fantastic. John Olajide, thank you so much. I'm very grateful. Thank you, Jason. I am grateful. I'm grateful. Oh. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Stay, stay tight. Stay real quick. I'll...